Hey, Jack, how's the baseball season from your perspective? Um, well, in the, in the aggregate, um, it's, it's a big plus that games are being played, notwithstanding the issues, particularly that have surfaced in St. Louis and Miami. Um, and more protocols are being implemented and, and generally followed. Um, there's some discussion that was in the news, I think, to this morning that, that um, the postseason might be played in a bubble mm -hmm. rather than in, in, in any of the stadia. Uh, I don't think that'll come to pass. Uh, the teams are going to lose substantial dollars. And particularly since the postseason will occur without fans, not to mention the regular season. Right. You know, but given, given the pandemic, the, the pandemic situation, um, it's as good as it can get. Could be a lot worse. If, um, with respect to the Reds, we're, we're in the middle of our pack, which is below, below all expectations. Um, so got to try to remedy that against the Kansas City team tonight. Hey, on a, on a per game basis, the television revenues down were consistent with previous years or up? I didn't hear you. What? On a, on a per game basis, are television revenues up, down, up. or flat? They're up? Uh, I, I don't know by how much, but up. It might be more than 10% up, the viewership. Because it's certainly, you know, this has to, this drives television viewership, uh, the fact yeah. that you can't get the game, for sure. Right, so, right. So, so look, let, let's, uh, let's, let's carry this on um, in, uh, after, afterwards, if we could. I just wanted to, to kick off, I'm in, I'm a little discombobulated, you'll see I'm in, I'm in Southampton on vacation. But uh, the tradition continues our 18th in a row. It's actually our 21st, but we, uh, we didn't really call this the weekly briefing um, in March. Uh, you, you see the agenda on, this, on the screen. I want to hand off soon over to Stephen Burke, and he's joined by uh, his team at ARS to go a little deeper on the macro. And then we have some spotlights. Uh, and then there's also a macro outlook that they're doing, um, as they've done for 47 years. Uh, we've got a great group here, so wanted to make it interactive as well. So just real, real quick in terms of some updates, the, uh, as you see here, the, the next deeper dive uh, is uh, next week, right after this briefing. And Simon, uh, Simon, are you on? I think you are. Um, or you're, he's going he's gonna to come on later with a couple previews from the keynotes, um, Gary in particular. Uh, as you can see, um, and then on the 16th, 17th, if you all should know, we're basically going to get the band back together in a way um, in terms of basically a, a, the economist perspective with Nancy and, and her team, as well as the futurist perspectives um, here with Erica. Uh, and we'll be turning it in over back over to, to Stephen, who will be sort of our continuous thread. I did want to just point out how many groups we now have and how they interact. So this is just the, the LinkedIn version of a couple weeks ago. Uh, but this is how, you know, pick future of work just by having a good group. Uh, they can interact with these other groups, um, even on cannabis and ag, which get together uh, and arguably with, with, uh, with medical cannabis, um, other aspects. And, and now that's going to be more of a, Part of our paradigm but more and more we're, we're heading to the app you know i think again I, I owe lots of people some beers for referring people onto the app so thank you uh, i'm not going to go into uh the one minute uh but if you have questions on how to get into the app again it's like our own mini network you can do all these things you can message you can ignore people's messages you can be as active or uh, as you'd like um but with that i'm going to turn it over Stephen, uh, to you and, and Ross, and you may want to introduce Ross if some, some here may not uh, have, have met him in person yet. Okay, thanks, Mark. Could I get the screen from you? Yep, all yours. 
right now I just have to find my screen here. So good morning, everyone, and thanks for, uh, for joining in again today. I'm joined by my partner, Ross Taylor, who is uh, uh, one of the lead portfolio managers at ARS, and he's going to be talking about some stock ideas that we're using in our uh, all-cap strategy that we'll touch on and uh, also answer questions on navigating what is clearly a challenging environment. So today we see the S&P within 1% of a new high and sentiment nearing new lows. So this is an updated survey from last Thursday night. You see the bullish uh, views down around 23%, bearish views up around 47, 48%. Um, and it's pretty understandable. We have a, a very uh, perplexing time uh, in the world. Uh, every time we get good news, we get bad news uh, accompanying it. So we're close to a, uh, another stimulus package, but we can't get one done. Uh, Russia might have a uh, vaccine, um, but then I heard the numbers of if uh, all the vaccines were approved, we might have only 150 million uh, uh, doses available in the next uh, six months. Um, and a lot of them vaccines they're believing are going to take two doses. So uh, we're only going to get a fraction of the people. So very hard to see how we return to normal activity uh, until we have people confident that they can do all the things they were doing pre-COVID or a lot of the things they were doing pre-COVID. And you've seen that with the rollout of sports and uh, we were just talking at the start of the call about baseball getting off and, and running, but um, how they're going to handle the playoffs is probably going to be done differently or the difference between the sports that have been in the domes or in the uh, uh, controlled environments versus the ones that weren't. And that's just a microcosm. We can't get schools opened up and the like. So it's easy to see uh, why you'd want to be cautious in this environment. And at the same time, there's a big hope for a rotation from growth to value which would speak to that we're getting past and moving into a more positive environment. In our view, we think there's going to be a lot of head, uh, head fakes that go on as we go through the course of, of the next several months. And that's not counting an election that we have coming up as well. So I uh, just thought I wanted to share that kind of sentiment with you for a minute. Um, Next, I wanted to talk about the dollar and its reserve status, which is getting a lot of attention lately because the dollar's weakened some. And I just did a little research on uh, the reserve, uh, total global reserves. And of last, last year around this time, there was about 1.7, I'm sorry, 11.7 .7 trillion of uh, global uh, FX reserves, of which about 6.8 trillion or 60% were held in dollars. The next nearest reserve currency was the euro, which is about 2.2 uh, uh, trillion or 20% of the reserves, followed by the yen and the sterling at about 1.1 trillion each for 10%. What's important to know is that with about 6.8 trillion of currencies in dollars, also you have 40% of world debt is issued in dollars um, and 90% of Forex trading on a, on a daily basis is occurring in dollars. So clearly the dollar, as the dollar goes, so does other things. We believe that the strength of, a, of a, an economy is reflected in its productive capacity and that therefore gets translated into its currency. And we think the innovative and entrepreneurial culture of the US continues to improve our productive capacity and therefore the dollar's status as the leading reserve currency is in, is in good standing still. And it's going to be in good standing for some time because we don't see viable alternatives at this point in time. And the reason for that is, is multiple. At one point, it looked like the euro was going to be able to step up prior to the financial crisis. And when that hit, people lost confidence in the ability of the euro to uh, govern effectively given the divisiveness that's going on there. <clears throat> and, and will you feel comfortable uh, backing securities when they're having trouble with their governing structure, which was a flaw from the start. Um, the yen time came and went, the sterling's time came and went, and sterling lost it and gained it because of their ability to uh, meet all their needs through their um, both domestic and through their colonies. Uh, once the colonies went away, the, Euro, the sterling started to lose its status as reserve currency. So it's easy to see how it can come and go. China at one point looked like it was on pace, but their capital market system isn't 
structured enough. And now with, uh, there'll be questions whether you would ever give a country with uh, ruler for life reserve currency status. So for our take on what's going on with the dollar, this is normal ebbs and flows. And when you look at the chart, this goes back to 2015, we're really right within the range of a normal trading activity with ebbs and flows of strengths and weaknesses of the economy. We think the recent weakness in the U.S. is really reflective of, um, quite frankly, the, the inability of the U.S. to address containment as well as Europe and China have done. Um, now, it's not necessarily a fair comparison when China can lock down their country the way they can, but it is a fair comparison to Europe where they actually have done a much better job of containing the virus. And as a result, that's attracted flows away from the dollar but it's also a kind of a rebalancing, which as soon as the pandemic hit, we had a big dollar shortage. So it was high dollar demand. So there's ebbs and flows that are going on. We think this is normal, but we think there are three very healthy aspects to it. And the first is it helps global growth by reducing the pressures on emerging economies, particularly the highly indebted ones with dollar denominated debts. Second thing is uh, it helps with the translation of foreign earnings for US companies as about 55% of the S&P 500 earnings come from overseas. And third and, and uh, very important is it encourages uh, and helps aid commodity price increases since commodities trade in dollars. And this reduces the risk for commodity producing countries and companies. So Russia, Brazil, Indonesia, some of the Middle Eastern countries have uh, seen a relief in the pressure and moving from $30 oil back up to in the 40s is a big benefit so we think nearer term, the dollar can remain under pressure um, while we're arresting the virus, dealing with the civil unrest and protests we have in the streets. And as we go into this highly divisive election season, longer term, we see its currency status remaining quite, uh, quite strong as long as we do what we need to do ultimately, which is to get our social, political and fiscal houses in order. Um, unlike any other time, it's important to note and this goes to why gold is, has done what it's done and why crypto has done what it's done. Um, when you're printing unprecedented volumes of, of currencies and it's being done around the world, uh, you're devaluing those currencies. So if we keep in a relative proportion our productive capacity and our printing of money to others, then we should keep our reserve status. Uh, but it does clearly give you a sense of why alternatives to dollars um, including uh, gold, uh, have continued to rise. You can print money with the touch of a computer button, but to uh, mine gold, you actually have to have labor created. And that creates a different level of store of value away from either Bitcoin or currencies that can be printed by computer. So we think that we're in, you know, we're in a period that's normal ebbs and flows. We think the dollar's status remains unchallenged. And uh, we think that we they continued weakness through the election. But this is part of a normal, healthy economy, not a, not a big shift. So I want to stop there and take any questions people might have on the currency. Well, one question, uh, Stephen, given that we're, we're focusing on crypto and blockchain, uh, or maybe someone else from the audience, you know, just to, to the extent that that might have an impact in the short, medium, long term. For storage outside the dollar. Well, you know, Mark, the bounce in crypto this year has been pretty significant and is a reflection, I think, of that. Um, but, but the longer term issues of a, of a cryptocurrency gaining broader acceptance will require either, uh, in our view, central banks getting together and creating their own, um, which defeats part of the purpose of crypto for some of the users. Uh, but gives it the backing and the confidence that uh, that you would do. But to replace the currency reserves into crypto is a big leap right now, in our view. I think uh, th this is Jonah here. I, and in terms of crypto, I, I, I read it on and off. Uh, I focused on it more before. I was doing uh, gaming and esports. But um, what's interesting and it's uh, as important is I am seeing a lot more accessibility to the currency the adoption of new uh, wallets, um, 
a lot of the exchanges like your Binance's of the world or your Kraken's, they're becoming more and more uh, normalized in, in younger culture. Um, I personally don't think it requires centralized banks to become normalized, but I think banks will, will get involved because it's becoming normalized on its own. So I think that, that uh, chicken or the egg sort of situation, it doesn't matter, it's gonna happen. Um, you know, I just think probably it's another five to 10 years for it to normalize before it becomes massive, but it's doing it really quickly. Is there, uh, this is Jay, is there any thoughts about maybe China doesn't have it right now, but uh, Russia and China are certainly stockpiling quite a bit of gold? Uh, is there a risk if that one of those currencies is backed by gold um, becomes that threat to the dollar? I mean, if we move back to a gold standard, there's always a chance of that. Um, but, you know, you have to have, to have a confidence that central banks are going to put their foreign reserves into, um, into a currency, whatever currency it is. You have to have confidence, not just in the near term, but in the long term, that you have all the backing that you need behind that. So whether it's rule of law, whether it's a deep capital market system, whether it's money good um, is what's going to matter there. Um, so could they do it? If you get enough gold, yes. Um, uh, are they going to do that soon? Not, not likely in our view. Hey, Steve, it's Rob Colorini here. On going back to oil for a moment, who do you think blinked here uh, with respect to um, uh, Eastern Europe or Middle East on, um, on, the, on the price battle they had? I think at $30, everyone blinked, to be honest with you, Rob. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, everyone's suffering. If you look at the, the uh, fiscal position of most of the petro producers, it's not good. And the demands on them are quite high. If you look at the Saudis, they've been drawing down their currency reserves, 35 million a month for, for or so for a while. They, you can't keep doing that. So they need higher oil prices. So it behooved everyone to get somewhat higher oil prices. Um, but the problem is even with higher oil prices, you need higher demand, which means you need a return to normal activity. So there was a balance that they were fighting with that. But if you don't have the demand, the lower oil prices don't help anybody either. So um, I just think everyone had to move on this one to get, get into a more sustainable position um, and prepare for it. But I don't think anyone won on that one. Steve, based on your comments on how really the U.S. is the only reserve currency, and that's a lot of wind under the sails for the U.S. Fed to continue current monetary theory of hitting the, hitting the print button. And uh, so, so at what point does this become an issue? You know, it's a great question, Jim. The, the issue is a relative one as well, because if everyone's printing in a similar fashion um, or an equivalent fashion is a better way to say it, um, uh, as a percent of their uh, GDP, as a percent of their uh, uh, debts, then, th then what matters is um, are we all, if it's a race to the bottom, is it proportionate or not? And, and are we out of balance with the others? And I think when, you, when I gave uh, the percentages of um, how much uh, printing of currencies has gone on around the world between uh, the US and Europe, we're both running about 44% of GDP is what fiscal monetary stimulus has been done. In China, it's been less, but um, it's around 20% or less. Um, but in Japan, it's 60%. In the UK, it's 20%. So that's where the reserve currencies are in those four, five areas. So if we're all printing, it's a question of a relative question, um, as well as what the prospects are for the recovery and how you use your fiscal stimulus. China historically has been very good about getting a, a lot of return out of their stimulus, um, particularly their infrastructure spend. Other countries have had mixed results in that, 
but if we don't solve the problems of inequality and more sustainable growth around the world, uh, then you're going to continue to have a, a weakening of all currencies, which would create the door for uh, what Jonah was talking about, because if you lose confidence in all the governments, you'll go for an alternative source. And then a Bitcoin could be that alternative source if people have confidence in it. So it's still a relative game. Any other questions on this uh, topic on U US reserve, dollar reserve? Hey, hey Stephen, you, you, uh, you, you got my question on the relative basis. What, I'll, I'll put you on the spot. Where, uh, where do you think maybe the floor might be on this recent move? Uh, hard to say, to be honest with you, Bill. I'm not an expert on it, but if you're looking at the chart, we could be getting close to it already. Um, but the other low would be what you saw in, in uh, what looks like August of 17, somewhere around there. But um, I, I doubt we're going to have a, just a continued straight run down, but listen, what, who knows the way the markets are acting these days. But uh, I, I would think that, you know, we've, I don't think the Euro's that strong. Um, I don't think China's that strong right now. I think they've both done a better job of containment. And if we did a better job of containment or were able to get a reversal, how fast do you think the dollar would move back up? So I, I just think that it's going to depend on uh, on those factors. And I, I wouldn't expect you'd see a, a steady drop down. I think we're, when you look at this chart, the trading range has been pretty defined. Makes sense, thanks. You're welcome. I hope you're feeling better, Bill, and your family. Yes, yeah, we're definitely on the upswing. Appreciate Excellent. it. Excellent. Good here. Any other questions on this area? I'm curious, just t Todd Rupert's on. T Todd, are you on, do you mind, do you have a, a view on this? Uh, thanks, you know, I, I really don't know. The, the answer is probably not. I, 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 don't, I don't follow currencies that closely. Uh, I just try to keep a diversified portfolio. So I'm, I'm not really going to be adding anything to the, the, the great comments Stephen had. Right well, I want to move on any, if, unless anyone has any last thoughts. Stephen, you want to have you and Ross go in the other subjects? Yeah, I just wanted to do it uh, just quick on the climate. Uh, you know, we had this terrible storm. Those of us in the Northeast are still trying to get power back on. Um, but it was the ninth named storm in the Atlantic, which is a record for this early in the season, according to the New York Times. Uh, I scuba dive, so I'm very interested in water temperatures and the like, and uh, what's driving the climate change. So um, the Climate uh, Prediction Center just upped their forecast for Atlantic storms to 19 to 25, up from 13 to 19 because of the water temperature change. So I just want to show you a chart. There's some other factors, but this is a chart from uh, 1880 to 2015 of the global surface, sea surface temperatures. And you can see the rise coming up. And whether it's the sharks up on the, you know, in the Northeast on the Atlantic now, or it's the barrier reef that's uh, uh, bleaching over because of the, the water temperatures. I just looked at the temperatures in the Gulf Coast, um, averaging about 85 degrees uh, today. Um, so I would just say expect uh, more volatility in, in climate uh, impact on, on how, we're, how our commerce is working. And the, we have areas down here that have been down since last Tuesday without power or internet still. Um, and this is this is the Northeast of the United States. Um, so we're gonna have more problems with climate and uh, more volatility. So it's something we should factor in to our investment decisions as we go forward. Um, I wanted to just uh, take a, make a switch here and, and I invited my partner, Russ Taylor to join. Uh, Russ is a uh, uh, over 30 year uh, veteran of uh, working at heading up equities for US Trust. He worked with Bruce Kovner at Caxton for uh, a decade as a partner there, and then uh, joined ARS and its successor firms uh, back about 12 years ago. 
Um, and I want to just touch on our all cap strategy because we talk about our macro views. I want to show you a bit about how we employ them with one of our strategies. So our all cap is a high conviction strategy, 30 names max, unconstrained by uh, sector or market cap weightings. Uh, it's very opportunistic in its approach and uses our macro views uh, to develop a portfolio. We've talked about the views. We're still big on tech. We're still big on industrial material investments, um, healthcare, and then dividend growers and special situations. And one of the key elements that's coming out of this crisis is uh, we think more and more businesses are going to do a lot more M&A. And that's an area that's going to pick up and it's going to redefine companies and industries pretty significantly. So I just want to share with you uh, our performance. This is through June of uh, one, three, five. And uh, since inception, numbers are all quite good. Ten-year numbers, not as good. Um, but for 27 years, we've outperformed the uh, Russell net of fees, uh, Russell 3000 net of fees by over 110 basis points a year, 27-year um, period. So we're pretty happy with that. And as you can see on the one year and year to date, we're uh, doing quite well uh, also. We're up about 11% uh, net of fees coming into today. Um, so I'm going to show you what our uh, difference is and why uh, when we've had the discussions about uh, passive versus active, I'm in the passive and active camp, as I've mentioned, because you can combine a portfolio like this with a passive strategy or can use it to add on to uh, other holdings. But um, as you can see, we have about 28 names. We are active users of cash to deal with volatility. And we have both names you know and some you don't. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Ross, to talk about a few of the names that um, are not as common on people's radar screen. And we'll leave this up so you can ask questions as well. So Ross, do you want to share a couple of the names that are the lesser trafficked ones? I hope he's on. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. The host clearly decided they didn't want me to talk because they had muted me just as you did that. Well, that was me. Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> I actually just thought it was kind of funny considering people know that I tend to like to talk. Uh, and they haven't heard you on so, the school yet, too. <laughs> fortunately. Uh, performance for the first seven months of this or so of the year has been largely a matter of two factors, you know, how exposed you are to you know, the COVID plays such as vaccine developers and testing of treatment companies, and then what your exposure is to what I used to call the rollerball economy, or might call the five horsemen, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And as Stephen was talking and showing some numbers earlier, so far this year, the market's basically been what you might consider to be a closed loop, where money tends to flow from one sector to another. It's been hard for every sector to advance strongly on the same day. It was pretty easy for them all to go down strongly in early March. But since then, it's really segment moves have been come at the expense of other segments, uh, growth coming at the expense of value and the like. And I thought it was interesting. I read this morning that the Russell 1000 now has less than 300 names that make up the growth component and over 700 names that make up the value component. And that's the greatest disparity that that uh, index has seen in 25 years by the number of names, uh, the amount of capital uh, flowing into one area versus the other. But you know, there's been a lot more going on this year than just you know the five horsemen and a bunch of COVID developers. And you know, what we look at and try to do through our macro approach, looking top down, is find areas that are a bit off the beaten path or find, you know, themes that are going to work and find names that are a bit off the beaten path. And one of the names that I think is most interesting is a company called Vicor. The symbol is V-I-C-R. Vicor has developed a very unique and patented power management technology. I think one of the most interesting things is that you know, a lot, we're moving more and more electric. Cars are electric. Uh, we have the cloud, AI, you know, some of the biggest users of electricity in, in any given region are now, you know, uh, server farms and, and the cloud and things of that nature. AI is a massive uh, data hog and uses a lot of electricity. 
the Internet of Things, virtual reality, all these things are basically driving a greater need for electricity and the management of electricity inside uh, electronic and microelectronic systems. Most of these systems are power hogs. They pull down a huge amount of power, and anyone who's you know felt the back of their tablet or their um, phone heat up to a point where you can barely touch it knows that that you know or seen that problem and that's the result of inefficiency it eats through battery life it makes things inefficient it reduces the ability to run complex transactions or slows them and the like what Vicor has done is developed a way to bring down rapidly and efficiently power from kind of an unregulated stream when it comes through the the outlet in your home or wherever it is it comes through usually around 48 volts or at a very unregulated level and needs to be brought down to manage it. I actually find it interesting. Most electric cars have a lead acid battery in them because it's easier for them to use the lead acid battery connection than try to bring power down to, uh, so you're literally sitting on a battery that needs a battery if you want to plug your phone in or light a cigarette. But what Vicor has done is managed this so that they actually bring power from 48 volts rapidly down to the single volt levels that it, that's usually used at. And they do that efficiently without a lot of waste. Uh, most systems now use kind of a gating process. It's almost think about it like forcing, you know, water, pressing water down through something. So there's always a lot of slop that overflows. That's the heat you feel on your phone or your, or your tablet is that inefficiency. These guys have gotten it down to where it runs very well. They've been winning a, a number of contracts in the AI and in the, um, the cloud area from the names that you would expect them to be winning those from people, you know, Google, Amazon, others, um, and the like. And we think that what's going to happen over the next few years is this type of technology is going to become a requisite technology for the way the world develops and the way these technologies develop. If you want to have self-driving vehicles, you need 5G. 5G means you need to move a lot of data rapidly. That means you need to use electricity efficiently. Um, you know, the, the grid is pretty inefficient, and I, I assume Stephen in the past has probably talked to you about our view that the grid is an area that needs to have a lot of investment put into it. You know, what Vicor is doing is basically helping reduce the level of investment that's going to need to be put in, but it's doing it at the uh, device developer level, not the, um, not the electric grid level. Another name we have that we like and we've been involved with for a while is a company called Biohaven. Biohaven's a drug development company. It started up in New Haven. Basically, they got their start when Pfizer and a couple other companies took their uh, drug development operations out of that market to try to consolidate and save money. And Biohaven was formed by some uh, drug developers who were state who stayed in that market and didn't want to move out of the New Haven area and the like. And they've gotten their first drug approved by the FDA a couple months ago. It's called Nurtec. It's used to treat and prevent migraines. It's uh, migraines is one of the fastest growing markets out there. If you watch television, you see a lot of ads for different companies with their migraine product. In only a couple of months in a COVID-impacted environment, Nurtec has actually taken over 50% market share in their space, and they're working on a number of new applications for it, a number of new ways to deliver it, including you know, uh, areas that are technologies that cause it to dissolve much more rapidly than it used to. And they're, in addition, working on a number of other drugs. Uh, I think long run Biohaven would like to be a drug development company as opposed to a drug marketing company. Uh, but they have um, right now a number of opportunities that uh, could be pretty exciting. We honestly thought they probably would have been sold at or bought by now, but um, they have chose to go on their own, I think, to help kind of establish their bona fides. And with their other drugs in mid to late stage development, we expect that uh, somewhere in here, not only will they see a significant uptick in revenues and earnings, they're losing money right now, but that should change. But also that they'll become very attractive to some of the bigger um, macro cap drug developers, big pharma names, because of their unique ability to reach around and develop 
uh, drugs uh, across a broad spectrum. Another name that we have that fits with our strategies is CHEG. We got into CHEG last year. Um, Rob, a number of us have, uh, yeah. So it's Mark. Uh, someone yeah. in the chat was just asking me to identify the company you were just talking about. That, that was uh, Biohaven? Biohaven. Biohaven. B-H-V-N is the symbol. And it's sort of the way we work. We actually developed a very strong relationship with these guys. And uh, over a year ago, year and a half ago, they came into our office and we were talking about a number of things. What, and their bankers were pushing them very aggressively to do a secondary offering at the time. And we actually told them we thought a secondary was a mistake and that they should find a strategic. And what they ended up doing was they found uh, Royalty Pharma to invest in them, bought stock above the market, not below it, um, took back a small royalty, a very small royalty on the Nurtec drug. And in fact, the way we operate that investment uh, recently, Royalty Pharma has come public and we own Royalty Pharma now as well. But, you know, we try to develop these situations where we get to know companies, know management and, and develop um, a rapport with them that you know, where we learn about their company and hopefully we can also help particularly a company like Biohaven, which quite honestly is very sophisticated in its space and not particularly sophisticated with regards to Wall Street. I mean, there are a lot of people who think if a Goldman banker tells you something, it's actually what, what you should be doing. Um, we like to remind people Goldman bankers tend to, I was a partner in a major hedge fund and we used to say hedge funds were compensation structures, not portfolio management styles. It's a little cynical, but it's kind of what it is. I think investment banking is somewhat the same, you know. But so Biohaven's a pretty exciting company. Well, can I just, and they have a lot of opportunities. I want to keep it interactive. I know your, your, your outlook is at 12, but still out. Our style here yeah. is that people ask sure. questions and fire away. But I mean, has anyone got questions on either these names or these strategies? Um, because I, I just wanted to go into a lot. We usually talk macro, macro concepts, but now we can talk. You know, we can talk names. Well, going from going from uh, just a comment on Biohaven, going from drug marketing to drug creation is a, is a very significant pivot. Can you talk about that a bit more? Well, what we felt they did, what they were doing was they ideally were looking to find a partner that would market Nurtec for them. Uh, being a first time in the field player without an FDA approval, bluntly that left them in a position to be exploited. So they weren't getting good deal offers. They weren't getting the kind of uh, relationship I offers that they wanted. Heavy rainfall in Telangana. Excuse me. Go ahead, Russ. Yeah, so what, we, what they, they felt they needed to do, and I think it was appropriate long run, was to get out in the marketplace to establish, get a product out, establish that they could bring a product through the FDA and bring it into the market and establish market share presence as a small company. And then that puts them, when you sit down with Pfizer, if you, don't, if you have nothing, if you've never done anything and you don't have a, a cash flow product in your pocket, bluntly, you know, they're sitting at that table looking at you like you're on me. And so Biohaven recognized, this is where you get to the, the sophistication of these companies. You know, they really know how to develop some really interesting drugs. They're working on a, 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 a drug that could uh, address nerve pain and anyone who ha has nerve pain issues understands that you can't address nerve pain at this point in time, but to get a fair deal, to get a fair, you know, to give up a fair uh, royalty and the like, they felt they needed to show that they could go on their own and going forward could go on their own. And I think it's an investment in the future for them. And they've been able to gain substantial share already in the market with their efforts. So yes, generally it's, and I think that down the road, what these guys would like to do is, is develop drugs and sell them. Right, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, anything on, on, any more on uh, Biohaven or on Vicor? 
Russ, let's just let them ask any questions because we're going to have to jump in a minute. So if they have any questions, okay. have any of the names up uh, here? Yeah. Or... yeah, should we buy now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that uh, now is always the hardest time to invest. I think Biohaven is uh, particularly exciting. They reported solid numbers yesterday. The stock got kicked in the teeth. So a lot better buying today than you were buying on Friday. Um, I do think that long run, it's, I mean, when you look at it, Biohaven has a $3.7 billion market cap. It's addressing, you know, the migraine market is one of the biggest, fastest growing markets, and it has the ability to gain substantial shares. So I think that we'd be comfortable putting new money into it. And the way we like to operate is we establish positions and names we like, and then we build them opportunistically. The other thing, Jack, that we do is uh, since we run separate accounts, not funds, um, it allows us to uh, incrementally uh, build a portfolio for our clients based on the, the valuations at the time we get the money in. So we're less concerned about dispersion than we are about uh, getting the right values and the right weightings at the right time. Um, and that allows us to uh, be consistently going into the market to take advantage of the opportunities in the portfolio given the volatility. Um, but we build incrementally, and uh, particularly when you have so much uncertainty, which is part of the reason for our higher cash position. In normal times, we would be probably having to raise, raise cash to collect our fees, um, but we haven't been in normal times for a while, and we've been probably averaging 10% cash to take advantage of the volatility for the last two years. So in other words, buy, yes, you, you can buy and buy more if it gets weaker. Yeah. And we've also been very aggressively trimming. So a company that Russ didn't touch on, but we've had in the portfolio, it's been as one of the hotter stocks due to the educational learning is Chegg. And Chegg we bought back last year pre-COVID um, because we had a view of the stock and then it really has taken off. So we've actually trimmed it, I think, Two or three times this year, Russ, already? Yeah, we're playing with house money on the name at this point. If you think about it, we've taken out more than our entire original investment. And we like where it sits long run, particularly in an environment where colleges and the like are, are likely going to be remote this year. Or like my daughter goes to UVA and she's going to school in a couple of weeks. She's going down to Charlottesville. None of her classes are actually in classrooms in her first semester. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how you calibrate sectors. It's one of the very interesting things that you, you really have a very different sector approach than let's say the Russell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great we, question, Eddie. Um, the way we think about it is, uh, is the way investors did in the 70s, which is, you buy the names that you think have the greatest re return risk reward potential on the upside and avoid holding the ones that you think are going to be under pressure for an extended period. So um, with the current rate environment and structure, we're less excited about financials, although that's not all financials, that's mainly the banks. Um, but we, are, we don't want to chase things that are going to be a problem when we know they're a problem. Uh, and we are very flexible about adapting our portfolio. Um, so if you looked in the early 2000s, we, we could have been a Canadian investment firm with heavy weightings in energy, industrials, and materials, and virtually no, very little weightings in technology and healthcare at the time. So it just depends on what the environment's offering up. And we're very much the same way, I think. Right now, there's half a dozen S&P sectors we don't have any exposure to. Right. In the all cap product. And that's because we look at them and we feel that, you know, there's, and we don't have time to really kind of go through it, but there effectively is a playbook that people use. It's a traditional reset post recession or recession playbook. These areas will run. We're in one of the runs right now where you're seeing stocks like airline stocks and others doing quite well because people are saying they're going to come back. So they're going to come back strong. And we'll stay away from a lot of sectors because we're investors, not traders. And we just don't see the 
investment case to be made for many areas. You know, money center banks, uh, utilities at this level, you know, so you can get a better yield outside of the utility sector and in many ways less risk likely. So you know, we're not afraid to not be exposed to sectors. Stephen and Ross, I know you guys have to hop to your uh, to your noon call to prep for that, but uh, I'm, I think we're going to try to dial into that call uh, and, and at noon. So if anybody wants to just kind of passively listen in, they kind of they're going to cover their you know regular outlook call where you know they're going to go a bit deeper into their views of the macro environment where they see funds flowing. And I think they'll spend a little bit more time on specific names as well. If I'm right, Stephen, right? Yeah, that's correct, Joe, and and it'll be posted on our website another day or so, so people can. Uh, listen at their convenience on, on our website at arsinvestmentpartners.com. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to put, gonna on it today? no, he's not going to be on it today. Okay. It'll be uh, Russ and myself uh, answering questions from Andrew. Schmeiler. Just so you know, if you haven't met Arnold or Michael, that there are two 80 some things that run the firm. Well, or co-run the firm with Steven and Sean and, and Russ. So it's, it's an interesting group, interesting dynamic. They brought our averages up for experience. Right. <laughs> well, look, I want, I'll want i let you guys go, and Joe, you can figure out how to, how to give it. Well, you'll be dialing everyone into 12 o'clock who want to stick around. But I wanted to – let me shift gears. Uh, Zach Nasser is on from Dubai. And Zach I met in our one of our world tours, um, and he was working with Emar at the time, sort of the in-house uh, prop tech venture investing for, for that group. But um, – Zach, you've been tracking what's happening in, in Lebanon, Beirut uh, of late. So can you shed some light? Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'll just open the video. Um, thank you all for the great insights uh, on this call. Uh, I'll just uh, do like a quick shout out. Um, you might have heard in the news uh, about the Beirut blast that happened uh, last, uh, last week. Um, it was like unexpected. You know, there's just like a stockpile of uh, a lot of ammonium nitrate like sticking there and then like blast uh, went off uh, there's a lot of stories so i won't go into that i want to go into the uh, huge world relief efforts that have gone there a lot of companies have participated uh, like apple google um, and i know in, in this group there we cover a lot of industries uh, a lot of portfolio companies or like holding companies um, <clears throat> so i was going to share some of the things happening there some tips, uh, and also if you need any help or insights, you could contact me. So on the fund side, there is actually uh, an auction happening by uh, by Mia Khalifa to benefit Lebanon uh, Red Cross. So you could buy her signature items uh, there on eBay. It's, re it's reached like a hundred thousand dollars now. If someone wants like a, a fun uh, party story. Um, the other uh, uh, resources I was going to mention, I'll message them in the chat now. You could actually donate with tax exemption. There's a couple uh, avenues. There's global giving, uh, there's CAP America, and there's global citizen. Uh, so they include uh, Lebanon Red Cross, but they also have other organizations uh, that are vetted from before. <clears throat> uh, global giving also has specific projects. If you have certain areas you want to uh, benefit and it'll be tax exempt because they're US based. Um, uh, if you're interested in doing in kind stuff or you have a product uh, and whatnot, uh, I could help out with that. There are people on the ground. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe maybe Zach, you can throw it, throw it in the chat. But what, how, how do you think yep. things are going to develop there uh, over the next, you know, short term, long term? <clears throat> Um, about development, uh, it's, it's pretty ticky, uh, tricky. Like I know now in the global news, you might have heard the, uh, uh, the resignation of the minist ministers. Um, but uh, you, you have to look at the parliament really for, for actual change. So if there are like uh, accelerated uh, elections for the parliament, that's when you'll see change and actual like, improvements. Uh, and I think a lot of the, the foreign countries that are visited, like France, they're going to be aiming for that, like an actual shift in the, the old the brass, you could say, of, of leadership. But just the ministers changing, that's not going to have any any actual effect. So if you're actually gauging the, the, the situation for you know, actual involvement or investments or whatnot, uh, that's like on a political standpoint uh, what will happen. Um, Great. Yeah, um, so that's it. I'll, I'll just message these sources. You could uh, 
private message me if you need uh, any help or questions. Uh, hopefully, any someone like participates in this. Uh, thanks, thanks for the time, Mark. No, thank you, and everyone else. So I was going to yield, give the floor to Simon Vine uh, to talk about future of work. But I just got this text that he had to jump. So again, you'll, next uh, next week after this is uh, we'll have a, an hour and a half uh, focus on on future of work. You'll see some more on that separately. So w with the additional time, any just does anyone see anything that we should be aware of? You know, that's uh, scary or exciting. I'll start calling on people if uh, you don't raise your hands. You mean anywhere in the world? Anywhere in the world. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, that COVID has, has created a, a very, well, COVID combined with the accelerating disruption from technological advances is creating a very attractive time to invest in early stage venture capital. Valuations are depressed or getting depressed. Uh, and typically, if, if you take a look at vintage year, it's, you know, you can't really, you shouldn't really be timing. Uh, and entrepreneurship is not timing. Entrepreneurship happens all the time and it happens whenever it happens and it's, it's omnipresent. However, if you take a look at the best vintages of venture capital over the last 25 years, they were 2008, 2009, 2010. So putting money into the market when things were depressed and, and coming out in what hopefully will be a better environment has proven to be uh, work very well. So I'm, I'm a huge proponent with, with the public, as we heard earlier, with public markets a bit stretched with, with uh, the, you getting virtually no return whatsoever out of, out of bonds. Uh, Early stage venture is a is a is a is an attractive place to put money right now. And Todd, just curious, are there specific sectors or you know areas within venture, and, and how do you define early stage? Is it like you know pre you know B B and C rounds and earlier, or just kind of want to get a better clarity there? Um, I, I I say from seed stage up to up to Series B, and you want to diversify a portfolio. I guess the three broad areas I would say would be communications, technology, and, and healthcare. Uh, but you know, you know, selecting one individual fund or one individual sector can be very, very uh, risky, if you will. And if you can construct a portfolio uh, in a, in a kind of like a fund of funds manner that gives you broad diversification over a lot of companies in a lot of different sectors, uh, there's, there's, there's great downside protection. I mean, I don't mean to make it a, a commercial here, but one of the things that I do is uh, I work with a company called Greenspring Associates, which is based here in Maryland, where I am. And, and uh, um, we, we, the firm's been around for 20 years, and we've now raising our 20th fund of funds. But most people, when they look at venture capital, uh, they just look at it from a return aspect, you know, IRRs and distributions to pay it in and total value to pay in. Whereas if you look at the public markets, you're typically looking at risk adjusted returns. Well, we've created a means by which we can take a look at what risk are we taking on for the returns that we're generating. And it's very interesting and I'm happy to share it with everyone, but it, it just shows that you can construct a, a lower risk venture capital portfolio uh, with, with good returns. But anyway, I just, uh, I'm happy to, you know, Mark, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to share that stuff. But again, I just, that's where I'm put, putting a lot of my own personal money right now is early stage venture. And to Todd's point, um, in terms of that, a study of 2.7 million startup companies, uh, they found that a 60 year old startup founder is three times as likely to found a successful startup as a 30 year old startup founder. It is 1.7 times as likely to found a startup that winds up in the top 0.1% of all companies. So there's, yeah, there's you know, that's for the majority of us on this call. That's, that's, uh, well, you know, you know, uh, Warren Buffett, while he's not a venture capitalist, he made most of his money after the age 65, but you know, wisdom comes from experience and experience comes from making mistakes. And a 60 year old has made a lot more mistakes than a 30 year old. Exactly. 
Well, Jim and Todd, you're 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 you're, you're trying to charm us, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, I just you know I would like to add to what uh, some comments that Todd made, and I think you know what we see in venture often is at times of uh, great national or global distress and needs or disruptions, economic, and in this case, you know, uh, a virus, you know, is that there are a lot of problems to solve and people rally around solving those problems, smart people. So I would add that as a variable that makes venture attractive. If we look at a lot of companies that were, that are, that are dominant today, they were born in times of economic distress um, or social distress. So um, I think it's a great time to be in venture. And just, just as a side note, Mark, we are, you know, we traditionally focused on ag and early stage ag and food tech. Uh, you know, just because of the pandemic, we've we had some ancillary investments in medical technologies. And I think we view there's kind of three legs here that are really needed right now. And uh, it's ag and food tech, nutrition and the supply chain uh, and uh, medical technologies. We don't we stay away from pharmaceuticals, and biologicals, but uh, uh, medical technologies. Clearly, this has stressed the medical system. In educational technologies, although we're still trying to figure out, you know, what the ultimate uh, solutions are, who pays for it, and uh, how do you get to liquidity events, but we're, we're actively uh, researching in that area as well. <clears throat> so, just yeah, you know, I I, I echo your comment that you know the 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 uh, I call them the, the the structural, societal, and and cultural changes. Uh, that happen that are induced by by uh, the concealing crisis uh, create new market opportunities and new customer demands. Uh, and yeah, medical area is great. Ag, yeah. You know, also, in that are you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more interest in in or not interest in, but but people starting companies with an impact and societal lens. Uh, and, and so I think that's going to become more more prevalent. Which is a is a wonderful thing for society. So you, you, you got to try and take a look at the, uh, at the at the good side of of what a pandemic can provide, and it's sometimes a very concealing opportunity. You know, Todd, just like Torin, do you know Torin Kutnick? No, I don't. You should, you should know each other. Torin's family they built and sold two companies to Gartner and. And Torin invest in seed and early and seed and A. Um, just some people you should know. What we're tr we're trying to do is all these groups to have their own leadership, their own events, and I'm I'm throwing these lines out because obviously there's interconnectivity. Um, I'll come back to that next uh, next week. So, so Joe, I'm mindful we have 60 seconds before we move uh, out. Do you want to just? Are you going to be able to keep us on here so we just move on to that call for those who want to stick around? Yeah, I'm going to try to just dial in from my phone. I don't think there's a way to do it otherwise. So just let me know uh, how it sounds. Hang on, let me grab my phone and then I will uh, dial in. Fair enough. And, and again, if, every, if you haven't done it already, I'll throw the link on because the whole idea is, to, is for us to interact. Uh, on, we have an app now. If, if you haven't heard that, then... Um, you're, you're going to hear it in spades from me. So it's, we're, it's, we're up, getting up to 200 people. That's great. Um, it enables us to do a lot more together. And if it doesn't work, Joe, I guess we all could just, we can dial in directly, right? He's on mute. And if anybody's in the Hamptons this week, I'm, I'm sort of around. Sounds nice. Yeah, it's so beautiful out here. Lucky. Dimitri, what's up with Chicago? <laughs> Mark, where do I start? <laughs> and how much time do we have? Um, Ten seconds. Well, okay, so there was uh, organized looting um, 36 hours ago, and yesterday there was almost a tornado that ripped through the downtown. Um, 
So other than that, uh, and, uh, you know, defunding the police, um, a stream of people out of the city into the suburbs, uh, and continuous uh, shutdown. And a matter of fact, this weekend, uh, the, the state is taking a step back to phase three of uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, reopening. Um, everything else is fine. <laughs> do a deep dive on Chicago. Uh, I don't know if we want to do that. I know. Joe, how would Pretty Joe, soon there will be nothing to dive into. Hey, Mark, can you guys yep. hear this? Yep. Okay, is it okay? Yeah. Sound all right for you? Sounds all right to me. All right, I'm going to go on mute until it opens up, okay? So just bear with me. It should be any minute. All right, me too.